Roger Dale. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and verse number 46. As I said, this is a great follow up to uh, the fact, the text in Ephesians from last week. And what we have before us today is a is a miracle story about healing. And consistent with what we have seen so far in the Gospel of John, it demonstrates the deity of Christ in a very, very supernatural way. But at the same time, it's also a story about believing. Now let's start our time today by reading this text. Read in your Bibles or up on the screen, John chapter 4, starting in verse 46, and we will read through verse 54. Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour which he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So this is a story of a miracle. One of many that we find in the Gospels. Remember now that Jesus is ministry had started down in Judea and that's the southern part of the nation of Israel. If you have a map in your Bibles, you can look at that in the back. And in that southern part of Israel in Judea, Jesus did many, many miracles. In fact, we saw last time we were in John that when he came to Galilee, Galilee being in the northern part of Israel. Look at verse 45 again. It says the Galileans up there in the northern part received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem, which was in the south, at the feast. For they themselves, the Galileans, also went to the feast. So the Galileans from the north had seen the miracles when they went down south to Jerusalem for the Passover. And that is where they went annually. All the Jews did. So he did miracles in Judea at the beginning of his ministry. And in Judea, he did miracles at the end of his ministry. And then in the middle, in that three-year period, for about 16 months or so, He was in Galilee. And that's where we find him today here in our text. But remember again from last time in verse 45, how the, how the Galileans received Jesus as a miracle worker, having seen all the things that he did. It's just like those, if you remember back in Jerusalem from chapter two, they just saw Jesus as a miracle worker. And remember also in chapter two, he made it clear. He knew 
that that was all that they looked at him as. A miracle worker. Because he knew, remember, Scripture says he knew what was in their hearts because they had superficial faith. So across the board, it just could not ever be denied in all of Israel by anybody that Jesus was indeed a true miracle worker. In fact, there is absolutely nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where the leadership of Israel ever one time who rejected Jesus as Savior and Messiah ever questioned his miracle power. You will not find one syllable where they questioned his miracles. You really couldn't couldn't question that. It, it, it was impossible to question his miracles. The miracles that he did were too real. And, and they were too common. They were unmistakably divine. And there were far too many of them that occurred on a regular basis in Israel. And so again, the Galileans here received Jesus, kind of like Nicodemus, who saw Jesus at first as just a miracle worker. Remember in John 3, he said, nobody can do what you do unless God is with him. And, and that's still a rather common way that people believe in Jesus today as a miracle worker. Do you realize that there has never, ever been a legitimate, successful debunking of the miracles of Jesus in all of time since Jesus did them? Nobody has ever come up with proof that those miracles did not happen. And that's because they were real. There were too many eyewitnesses. There were miracles. These miracles happened in too many different places, too many times. They were too unique and, and, and they were differing events all over the nation of Israel. In fact, he did so many miracles that when you get to the end of the Gospel of John, look there in the very last verse. You know this one. In, in chapter 21 and verse 25, John says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that could be written. So, while we have this extensive record of the miracles of Jesus found in the Gospels, I'm here to tell you, you need to understand, wrap your mind around the reality that they are a drop in the bucket to the totality of the miracles that Jesus constantly did during his three-year ministry. And this one that we're looking at today specifically suits the Apostle John's purposes because this is also a miracle about believing. And you know that's what John wrote this gospel about. Remember John's message is, is against the background of the Judaism of Jesus' day, which is a system of religion, just like every other system of religion in the world that believes that you gain heaven by something that you do. We talked about that last week. Continue to keep in your mind Go through this gospel. There's always only really two kinds of religions that exist in the world. The religion of human achievement, earning your way to salvation, or the religion of grace by faith alone and Christ alone, the true gospel. All religions, other religions, are under that one category of what you do. And make sure you understand this. This is important because a lot of times we, we, we say things for shortness when we're speaking of doctrines. But any time, whether in prayer or conversation or in scripture, even reciting scripture, 
Anytime we say, and you hear me say it often, faith alone and Christ alone, or anytime you hear me say, believing that word, what that always means is believing everything that is true about Jesus. You with me? Believing who he is, God in human flesh. Believing in what he has done and his work on the cross, his substitutionary atonement, his, his rising from the grave on the third day for our justification. When we use that phrase, believing in Jesus or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, biblically, that has a lot of detail to it. It, it means believing in everything that he is and everything that he has done. It means you, you believe fully in every aspect of the gospel. And, and it's just used for shortness. But you have to keep that in your mind, especially when you're talking to others about the gospel. There's no subject more important than that of what it means to believe. Do you remember? How poignantly Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe, remember everything attached to that, that I am he, you will die in your sins. So eternal salvation comes to only those who believe in the full, true person and work of Christ according to Scripture alone, the true gospel, not a shallow gospel, not a superficial gospel, not an inadequate gospel, the true, full, complete gospel presentation of who Christ is and what he has done. Now, a great text to learn more about this is found in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And you know, this is known as the faith chapter in the Bible. And what we have here is a very important definition of what it means to believe. It's very popular today for, for people to say, I'm a believer, or I have strong beliefs. Or have you heard people say, I'm a person of faith? And they just kind of throw that out there. Or oftentimes, have you heard people say, well, I'm very spiritual, right? Meaning, they believe in certain things. And, and when these type of folks talk about believing in something, it's always in a, in a self-designed and self-devised kind of notion. But that is not how the Bible describes faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one with me. Look how it starts out. Now faith is. So here's the definition, okay? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we know right away here that faith involves something that we don't have and faith involves something that we can't see, naturally speaking. Remember in 1 Peter 1.8 where Peter says, and though you have not, seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So faith involves something not yet fully attained, something not seen. That's faith. And if you don't know any better, you can be misled by this subject. Because there are a lot of things in life 
for which we exercise faith in things that we can't see. Things that we hope for that we're not sure about. For example, let's say that I have to have serious surgery on my right hand and the doctor comes in and he draws a smiley face and the word yes on my right hand after I've been completely knocked out by anesthesia in order to make sure that he does the surgery on the right hand and not the left hand. And as they put me to sleep, I have to trust that he finds that that happy face on the right hand in the OR because I'm out cold, right? I mean, you've heard stories of people who have gone into surgery and had the wrong leg amputated, right? We've all heard stories like that. Now, human faith, which is what that is, has two components. One is that it is based on experience. In other words, you know that it usually goes right. It's like when you go to a restaurant. You choose from the menu and you eat what they give you on your plate. But you have no idea who's in the kitchen or what they are doing in said kitchen. You just assume and you trust that this is what you ordered and that it is safe to eat. Why? Because people do it all the time. Some of you are going to go to a restaurant today. And generally, everything is fine, right? But it isn't always safe. Have you ever got food poisoning from something that you ate? at a restaurant before. From time to time, we see reports on the news of awful things that people do in the kitchen before they go serve the food. That's just reality in America and all over the world. But experience tells us that you can usually trust eating in a restaurant, but also sometimes it goes wrong. Sometimes people go into a very routine surgery and they don't come out alive. Chrissy and I know two people who had the exact same surgery as she did, routine gallbladder surgery, who died on the operating table. They were not expecting to die. They were told everything would be fine. They would even go home that day as she did after her gallbladder surgery. But we're not talking here in Hebrews about that kind of faith. That's not biblical faith. We're not talking about a human kind of faith that is based upon a repeated experience. We're talking about something for which you have had no experience. You are putting your eternal destiny into the hands of a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth who lived 2,000 years ago. And you've never done that before. You don't have that experience to build on. So why did you do that? Why would you leave behind your worldly, fleshly, earthly way of life? Why would you say no to all your worldly ambition? Why would you say no to everything that you want to do in and of yourself? Why would you say no to and enter into this great struggle with all of the things that delight your fallen nature and instead make the decision 
to surrender your life to Christ and to live for Christ. Well, for one thing, that's the only way you get to heaven when you die. And you don't know anything about heaven other than what has been revealed to you in Scripture. Contrary to what's all in those stupid books that people say they go to heaven and come back. None of that's true. When you come to Christ on his terms, what I'm telling you is you're taking a serious step. That is the most serious step that you have ever taken in your whole life. If you're, if you've truly come to him on his terms of repentance and faith, not just intellectual belief, the devils believe intellectually and tremble. And you have nothing to base this experience on, this saving faith. So you better be sure that this is a move that you really want to make. You need to know that that move of faith is not going to go wrong. And that's what verse 1 here in Hebrews 11 is saying to us. Faith is the assurance. Faith is the conviction. Now let's think about those two words for just a minute. <coughs> what do we mean by the word assurance? The, the, the Greek word speaks of a, a foundation. Uh, literally to stand under. I mean, if, if you're sitting on a, a, a concrete foundation, it's not subject to a whim. It's not subjective, it's objective, it's concrete, it's full of rebar. So so we believe in something that is absolutely firmly established and concrete. And what is that? That is the word of God, right? We believe in the promises of God. We believe in the commands of God. We believe in the truth of God as revealed to us in the Holy Scripture. So when we talk here about the, the assurance of something hoped for, it's, it's not assurance in an, a, a, a subjective sense. It's not a personal feeling that you have. It's not an intuition. Faith is the foundation, the, the concrete certainty about truth which comes down to the truth of the word of God. That's, that's how Hebrews is, is describing biblical faith, which then focuses on the reliability of the gospel, the truth of the gospel contained in the scripture. What we are talking about here is certainty. And although we haven't been to heaven and back, the one who dwells in heaven has sent us full and complete and accurate as information as he wants us to know about heaven. We've got all that he wants us to know about it. Everything we need to know is revealed on the pages of the inherent word of the living God. And so it is a firm, certain, concrete in which we believe. And then that leads us to the second one. Conviction. Conviction goes right alongside assurance. It means something that we hold to with absolute commitment. So when we talk about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not just talking about pie in the sky. This is not some type of esoteric feeling. This isn't about some kind of Jesus of your own imagination that many people make up. No, as Christians, we believe in the absolute veracity and reliability of Scripture, which alone defines Jesus, which alone defines faith. And the gospel contained in that scripture to the point that here's what we're doing. We're taking the information out of the revealed word and we are banking our eternal destiny on the truth of scripture because we're all going to die. And it becomes for us, once we do that, the dominating conviction that drives our living life every day and that informs our hope. 
and hope. Remember biblical hope. Dr. Lawson gives that <clears throat> great definition, uh, a, a, a certain assurance of a future reality. That, that, that's the kind of faith that we're talking about. Real faith, saving faith, truth revealed in Scripture. <clears throat> we're all called to believe that gospel truth. And it, and it, and it must be based on this, this firm foundation and this strong conviction. And not to do so is the ultimate tragedy in every life that doesn't do it. <coughs> Excuse me. It's an eternal tragedy. Because here's what people miss. Every person will exist forever in consciousness. Think about that. <coughs> Every person conscious of either eternal joy or conscious of constant, never-ending judgment of God but conscious nonetheless. Thank you very much. Now for one of those Marco Rubio moments that I hate. Good old upper respiratory. But think about that. Nobody leaves consciousness. You don't go into soul sleep. You don't go into some kind of period where you don't know what's going on. When your eyes close in death, you will be either absent from the body and present with the Lord or you will be in the outer darkness. Now, I don't make the rules, folks. I'm just tasked with telling you what the rules are. So the Apostle John in his gospel here takes up the issue of believing and, and, and it's the issue of all issues. Building your life in time and eternity on the firm foundation and conviction that the Bible containing the gospel is absolutely true. And if you choose in your life not to believe, the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, look what it says in Hebrews 10.31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Terrifying. Now let's go back to our text in John 4. When it came to Judah in the south and Galilee in the north in general, they, they both really fit into what Jesus says in John 4, 48. Look what he said. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. He was saying, you're, you're so stubborn. Even though it's clear that I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament, that I am the only one who could fulfill the Old Testament, detail by detail. And he, and he manifested that all through his ministry, all the way to the resurrection. All you people keep doing is demanding more and more and more signs and wonders. Let me tell you, that is the deepest kind of unbelief. Think of it. Those people in that time period, in that geographical location, had the God-man, right? in front of them. They had the light of the world. They could see him. They could hear him. They could touch him. They saw with their own eyeballs all the amazing things that he did and still thousands of them rejected him. That was the majority of Israel. And so here in our passage for today, and we're fixing to get to the passage, we, we have an illustration of really, when you stop and think about it, something that was very unusual in Israel. 
we have somebody actually being saved right here. Why do I say that? Well, do you realize that at the end of Jesus's three-year ministry in Judea, there were only 120 people gathered in the upper room. At the end of Jesus's ministry in Galilee, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6, there were only 500 people on that hillside out of the hundreds of thousands that lived in Israel and who saw and experienced Jesus in all of his earthly glory. Jesus crisscrossed every aspect of that land. They had the Old Testament. They had the fulfillment of the Old Testament right before their eyes. They had the signs. And he said, you still will not believe. That's what it all comes down to, folks. Believing. And here in our text is an illustration of belief and how one man believed and the whole process that involved that faith. So let's meet him now, starting in verse 46. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. This was a man who was an official of the king. What king am I talking about? Well, there was only one king in that part of the world, and that was the king of Galilee and Perea, an Idumean Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great. He was the Idumean non-Jewish ruler in that part of the world. And he was a vassal king. He was a puppet king. He, he served the, the purposes of Rome and he, he ruled his little kingdom as a, as a petty tyrant. He was under Rome's full control. And as you know, he was a very evil man. You will remember that John the Baptist denounced him for marrying his brother's wife. And he also had his wife's daughter dance for him and he told her, I'll give you anything you want. And what did she want? She wanted John the Baptist's head on a platter is what she asked for. Herod was a wicked man, but he was afraid of Jesus. And he was definitely afraid of John the Baptist. In fact, when Jesus started ministering, he thought John the Baptist had come back from the dead to get him. And by the way, in the entire ministry of Jesus, there was only one town in Galilee that Jesus never went to. And that was the town of Tiberias. You know why? Because that's where Herod lived. And Herod wanted Jesus dead. It wasn't yet time for that to happen. So here in our text, we have, it says, a royal official connected to Herod Antipas. He has a sick son in the town of Capernaum. Capernaum was a lake town on the northern end of the lake. It's a big lake. It's called the Sea of Galilee. You think of like Lake Pontchartrain. And this royal official obviously believes that Jesus is a miracle worker. He believes what the rest of the people in Galilee believe which was made clear, look back in verse 45 again, the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, just like the people in Judea back in chapter two. They had superficial faith. What did they believe? They believed that Jesus could do miracles. And that was it. Now, that's a starting place, but that better not be the ending place. But that's where this royal official is at this point. And Capernaum was really the, the headquarters of Jesus's miracle ministry in Galilee. In fact, Capernaum had so many miracles that Jesus said that if Sodom had seen what Capernaum had seen, it would still be around. Remember when he said that? He said it'll be worse for Capernaum in the time of judgment than that wretched city of Sodom because of what they saw of all the miracles of Jesus and yet they still rejected. 
So Jesus gets to Cana in verse 46. Capernaum was 16 miles northeast of Cana. So notice that this royal official had journeyed on a pretty good hike of 16 miles to get to Jesus. Look at verse 47. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, at this point, this man has moved from somebody having a view that Jesus is a miracle worker because everybody has seen it and nobody could deny it. But but, but what is it that moves a man from, from having this sort of detached view of Jesus as a miracle worker to moving much closer now to the reality of who he is? What moves a man like that is desperation. And that's still true today. Oh, people cry out to God in a hard spot when they hadn't talked to him in a long time, right? Jesus put it this way. The people who aren't sick aren't looking for a doctor. It's desperation that drives people. And it drove this man, the royal official under the hated Herod, to come to Jesus and beg Jesus, please give life to my son. Now skip down to verse 49. Look what he says. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. So for sure he believed that Jesus could heal his son. It's not a full faith at this point, kind of like the man in Mark 9 who said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. It's a partial faith. But go back to verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs of wonders, you simply will not believe. So that's what this is. You believe I'm a miracle worker? Great. That's fine. But that's not enough. Take note that Jesus accepted that faith because he did the miracles to bring people to that initial step because that's a place to start. I mean, and somebody might say, well, why would Jesus accommodate that kind of superficial faith? Because all faith has to start somewhere, right? You know my story. Why do you think he did those miracles? So that people would draw this conclusion that he was a miracle worker and make the necessary connection This is obviously supernatural what's happening here. And then by God's grace, go from there to the next steps. Look how Jesus responds in verse 50. Jesus said to him, go. Your son lives. And at that moment, the son's body was instantaneously, miraculously healed. And then something happened to the Father. Look next in verse 50. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. At first, he believed Jesus was a miracle worker. He believed in his works. Now look, he believes in his words. Jesus was not only a miracle worker, he was a truth teller. Never a man spoke like this man, they said about him. So this man here, this royal official, is moved from believing in the power of Jesus to believing in the words of Jesus. The trustworthiness of what he said. Look next in verses 51 to 52. As he was going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour which he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And right at that point, he knew. Look next, verse 53. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. 
and he himself believed and his whole household. Notice that phrase, he himself believed. Wait a minute, I thought he already believed. No, this here is a very emphatic statement. He himself, very emphatic pronoun. And what it emphasizes is that his faith now, he himself has gone to another level. And not only that, he himself believed and his whole household, just like with the Philippian jailer, he believed and his whole household. So we have moved now here from believing that Jesus is a miracle worker to believing in his words to now believing in his person to now believing in who Christ is. And I think somewhere in this encounter with this man, Jesus filled in the blanks of who he is, which ended up with he himself and his whole household believing in the fullness of who Jesus is. So think about it. We saw a whole Samaritan village hated by the Jews saved in the fourth chapter earlier. And now a whole household is saved. And a whole household could mean kids, wives, in-laws, even servants, all living in the same house. And now, not only Samaritans, but salvation comes to the household of a Herodian. The Herodian court, one of those people called Herodians in Matthew 22. More people absolutely hated by the Jews. What does that remind us of? It reminds us what we learned back in verse 42, that Jesus is the savior of the whole world, Jews and Gentiles, all races, all classes of people, from the fishermen in chapter 1 to the immoral Samaritan woman at the well, eventually to the highest level Pharisee there could possibly be, Nicodemus, and here the household of some Herodians. So when you are out there presenting the gospel, never forget It doesn't matter what a person has done. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter what they are currently involved in now. The gospel is for every person wherever they are in their life at any given time. But they have to believe that Jesus is more than just a miracle worker, a good man a great prophet. Again, believing in Christ is believing in the fullness of who he is, God in human flesh and in the fullness of what he has done in being a substitute for sinners in his work on the cross and his rising on the third day and providing proof of who he is and proof that the father was fully, completely satisfied in his wrath-bearing substitutionary atonement for every person who would ever believe. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and this great text, this great example. It's so so good for John to lay out for us these examples of people saved that that were hated by his own people, the Jews giving us this great demonstration that the gospel is for for everyone. It's for everyone today at every time. And I pray you give us courage to be bold and to go out and to share the only gospel that saves. Lord, it's the only thing that will turn a life around. It's the only thing that will turn a nation around, and our nation needs turning around. And we believe the power of the gospel has the capacity to do that, but you use the means of our telling it. Give us the courage to proclaim it with boldness and by using words. We pray that all that we've done here today has brought you 
maximum glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.